Perfect. Okay, so let, okay. let us start. It is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Martin Schweitzer from uh, ETH uh, Zurich. Martin is uh, very famous both for his papers on the foundations of mathematical finance and also as a long-term editor of Finance and Stochastics, which is one of the best uh, journals of our domain. And I think it would not be an exaggeration to say that many of us learned mathematical finance from Martin's papers. So please, Martin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. So what I want to present today is joint work with one of my former PhD students who on the strength of these results now went into banking and is earning a lot of money. So what I want to look at is absence of arbitrage, a fresh look. And I want to argue first of all that when we think we know what absence of arbitrage is, we don't really. So, here is a very simple example for you to think about. So, say you have a market with two assets, just two assets, there's no bank account, just two shares. And these are modeled by geometric Brownian motions. So, you have two geometric Brownian motions driven by two Brownian motions. Maybe the underlying Brownian motions are correlated or maybe they are not. And this is all that you have in your market. And now the question is, is this market arbitrage free? And if it is or not, in which sense? And when you look at the classical theory, then you will not find a direct answer to this question. Why? Well, typically what you do is, you first, you always look at discounted prices. So then you have your discounted prices and one asset with a constant price of one, which is the one which you've used for discounting. But now you have two completely symmetric assets. So which one do you use to discount? And then which concept for absence of arbitrage do you want to use? And I mean, you all know no free lunch with vanishing risk. This is from Delban and Schachermeyer. You all know no unbounded profit with bounded risk. This goes back to Karatsas and Kardaras. So let's have a look at this here. So let's just say X, this is the ratio S2 over S1. Okay. Now, if we use our first geometric Brownian motion to discount assets, then the discounted model is 1 in coordinate 1 and x in coordinate 2, because we divide everything by s1. And if we discount the prices by s2, then the discounted model is simply the reciprocal of x in the first coordinate and 1 in the second coordinate. And again, is there any reason in this very symmetric model to choose or to prefer one of these two assets for discounting? Not really. So we have two possible discounted models. So how do we define arbitrage free here? Do we say we have arbitrage free if this one, the first one is arbitrage free or the second one? What do we do? Well, okay, if I make a particular choice of the parameters, this choice here, then it's very easy to check that the ratio x is a martingale, it's non-negative, and it converges to zero, almost surely, just because it's basically an exponential of a Brownian motion. And what this implies is, because we have a martingale for x, of course, the model, when you have discounted with the first asset, is arbitrage free. You have the original measure as a martingale measure, so you have no free lunch with vanishing risk, so you also have NUPBR. But if you then look at the other model, the S2 discounted model, this is not arbitrage free at all because its first coordinate, 1 over x, explodes to plus infinity. So even the weaker condition, NUPBR, fails. And what can we conclude then? I mean, we really are looking at the symmetric model. 
And if we discount in one way, we would say happily this is arbitrage free. If we discount with the other asset, we would say absolutely not. This is far from being arbitrage free. But somehow absence of arbitrage should not really depend on discounting. So what's going on here? So here's the framework. More generally, what I will look at is at the general semi-martingale model of n assets, say, let me call these S1 up to Sn indexed by positive time. I have the usual definition of self-financing strategies. So just appropriate integrands such that the value at any time equals the cumulative gains from trade. And then I need a bit of notation. So let me fix a time horizon, positive, maybe plus infinity, and then look at all the possible total gains. So this is just final value minus initial value, where I look at all self-financing strategies and I'm assuming that Vt of say that the limit here exists. Of course, this limit always exists if t is finite, if t capital T is infinite, that's an assumption. I say a strategy is zero admissible if its value process is always non-negative. And then I look at all the final gains from zero admissible strategies and I use this notation GT admissible for that. And the final notion I need is the super replication price of some payoff at time t, t can be infinity. This is simply the smallest initial wealth of a self-financing and zero admissible strategy which dominates the payoff at the end. So these are all completely standard concepts. Okay. And then NUPBR says the following, this is Karatsas and Karadaras 2007, if we have a discounted market, then the following are equivalent. We have NUPBR, or you have this characterization, the space of admissible terminal wells. When you start with initial wealth one, this is what the one here stands for, is bounded in L0, or for any non-negative, non-zero payoff, the super replication price is strictly positive. Also equivalent, the dual description is there exists a super martingale deflator whose final value is strictly positive. And another equivalent description is the zero strategy is maximal up to infinity, meaning that this basically is rewriting this condition here a bit differently. So there's no non-trivial payoff such that we can improve on this payoff with arbitrarily small initial capital. And this is all very nice because we have equivalent characterizations. But as I've shown you in the example, if I discount in a different way, then I get a different concept. So this is not invariant under discounting. Now, Karatsas and Karadaras, they're bringing out the book soon. And there, at least for continuous prices, you have a similar result. The following are equivalent. So they have this concept of viability. And viability means essentially that you have all these properties on every finite interval. So for every time horizon t, which is finite, you have this boundedness in L0, or you have the super replication price po being positive, or there exists a super martingale deflator, or you have this maximality property up to time t. And this is very much nicer because this is now invariant under discounting. But if you have a model on the positive axis and you're only able to say anything up to finite horizon, it makes you wonder, so what happens at infinity? What happens if you allow investment all the way to infinity? So that concept essentially is just a local concept. And what we wanted to do is 
to find another absence of arbitrage concept, which is one invariant under discounting, but it also looks at the global behavior of S, of our prices. And the basic idea is similar to what has been done before. We say a market is arbitrage free if basically the zero strategy is maximal in some sense. And this is similar to what has been done before. So here you have maximality on every finite interval but then you don't know what happens at infinity or here you have maximality up to plus infinity but the kind of maximality here is not invariant under discounting and so for us the question really was so how can we define a good notion of maximality that makes things invariant under discounting the classic concept, the one I showed you before, which goes back to Karatsas Karadaras, Delban Schachermeyer, is you look at value maximality. So you say something is value maximal if you cannot find a payoff such that in terms of value, you can improve on this payoff by another strategy which is almost as cheap as your original strategy. And if you do this, then when you change units, when you discount, the value changes and then things go haywire. So what we now do is we say, well, we're not using values for comparing, but we use portfolios or shareholdings. So we start with something called a reference portfolio. I'll tell you in a second what that is. And then we say a strategy is maximal, share maximal, with respect to this reference portfolio if there's no proportion process, psi, which converges, uh, such that we can improve on this strategy by a non-trivial multiple of the reference portfolio up to infinity. So intuitively, a reference portfolio, I will give you the definition in a moment, is something you would like to have. And if you add to your theta at infinity, a non-trivial multiple of that, then you have to pay at time zero more than what you have to pay for theta. This is the notion of maximality we want to use. So what's a reference portfolio? Very simple. It's a self-financing strategy. It is long only and its value process plus the left limit of that is always strictly positive. So it's an investment where you can only go long and you never will be broke. That's what this here says. And that's something you would like to have. And the standing assumption we then make is there exists a reference portfolio like that. The standard example is if we have non-negative prices, then we can look at the market portfolio. Just buy and hold one share of each asset. Then this is a reference portfolio as soon as the sum of your non-negative prices is strictly positive and also its left limits are strictly positive. In other words, with non-negative prices, the market portfolio is such a reference portfolio unless your market completely collapses at some finite time point. And of course, if you have the classic setup where you have non-negative prices and the bank account, then adding up all the coordinates here gives you at least one. So that's always satisfied. So if you compare the concepts, then what is common is that a maximal strategy can only be improved at the non-zero initial cost. But the difference is how do we measure improvement? Traditionally, the improvement is in terms of wealth. 
and wealth is in the same currency units as your stock prices. So when you discount, this changes. For our new concept, the improvement is in terms of a reference portfolio. So it depends on some meta, and this is in numbers of shares. If you now discount your prices, numbers of shares remain numbers of shares. So by construction, this concept and everything we get from it is completely discounting invariant. In a nutshell then, and I'll be very brief about this, what are the main results? So we have two new absence of arbitrage concepts, something we call dynamic share viability. This says the zero strategy is maximal in this new sense, or dynamic share efficiency, DSE, which is stronger. This says every buy and hold strategy is maximal in this new sense. And in a way, this is a discounting invariant version of no unbounded profit with bounded risk. And this is a discounting invariant version of no free lunch with vanishing risk. Why? Well, of course, we have corresponding results. We have dual characterizations in terms of martingale properties. I will not give you the full theorem because this will take up a whole page. Essentially, what we have here is a new variant of the fundamental theorem of asset pricing. If you look at the classical discounted setup, then our new concept here lies between no unbounded profit with bounded risk up to infinity and this viability concept. So it is in between, as you would expect. And also, these implications do not go the other way around. We have counterexamples. You can also look at the version of this absence of arbitrage concept for simple strategies only. And if you have that, then you get automatically, without assuming that, a semi-martingale property for suitably discounted asset prices. And I should also say that these concepts depend, as you can see, in the definition here on a reference portfolio or a reference strategy, but that dependence is really quite weak. If you have different reference strategies and these are reasonably comparable, in a sense we can make precise, then the absence of arbitrage concepts are the same. So what does this give us for the geometric brown in motion example from the beginning well the following are equivalent we have this nupbr type property with respect to the market portfolio this is equivalent to saying the model coefficients satisfy one of these equations for i equal one or i equal two doesn't say a lot really i just write it for completeness but equivalent to that is one of the discounted price vectors, either the one discounted with the first asset or the one with the second asset, this must be a martingale. And this criterion, as you can see, this is really now very nicely symmetric in the setup. And also, this market never satisfies the stronger condition, the no free lunch with, that, with vanishing risk type condition. So we have a complete answer to these questions. Of course, we don't do this to answer questions about two-dimensional geometric brown in motion. We wanted to do this at the general semi-martingale level, but I don't want to bother you with the results about that. So I still have three minutes. So what else can I say? Well, we are here virtually at least, to celebrate the birthday of Marco Avellaneda. So let me give you some curiosities about Marco. Maybe you are aware of this, maybe you're not. So if you look at his mathematical genealogy, then Marco is a grandson of Chung. He's a great grandson of Harald Kramer, 
and one of his academic brothers actually is Jin Ma. I also looked a bit at his personal genealogy and probably the Brazilians and Argentinians know that his great-grandfather was the youngest president that Argentina ever had. Now, I also have some connections with Marco. One is obviously that we both share enjoying research in options, different places and over time. And let me also introduce a new concept and give you a proof. So you all know the famous Erdos number. Let me introduce here the Avellaneda number as the distance in collaboration to Marco. So my personal number is not one. I've never published with Marco. But my personal number is two. And here is the proof. So there's one paper here and there's a second paper which has the same author Dominic Samperi, one of Marco's PhD students. So this proves that my number is two. And finally, let me show you some old pictures of Rio. So these pictures I took from the publications also of Marco because there were three edited special issues where he was one of the co-editors for the volume. And you see here some people we have seen already earlier on the conference, but a few years younger. And you can see how things change over time. So this is from 2006. This actually is the poster of the very first meeting of the research in options series. It's also interesting to look at the, that the speakers here. The organizers are still the same after 15 years. Here is one picture from another location, Angra dos Reis. This is number five. There's another picture here at IMPA. This is a bit more recent, so you can see some of the faces have changed a little bit. But still, the group has remained remarkably constant over time, expanding internationally. And with this, I would like to end and say happy birthday, Marco. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the beautiful talk and for the beautiful pictures. Do we have any questions in the chat? I don't see any questions for the moment. Perhaps... Uh, Somebody is asking for the for the paper, but no questions. Okay, so I've seen the question, can we have the paper? This is available in a fairly recent form on my webpage. Yes, but now there is a question. Even two, two questions. So if you really see them, you can perhaps uh, answer. Okay, okay. I can. So, one question is Can you connect the reference portfolio to a risk free asset? Um, in a way, you can think of it as some kind of risk free asset because the reference portfolio, what it gives you is when you trade this portfolio, it's self financing and it never goes broke. So in that sense, investing in the reference asset is like investing in some kind of risk-free asset. And so in a way, our assumption says there exists some kind of tradable risk-free asset. Yes, in that sense, there is a kind of connection, but we are not discounting with this risk-free asset a priori, it turns out that discounting with that is a good thing, but that's not what we do at the beginning. Then Georges is asking, is there an interpretation of the conditions for the example? 
So let me go back to that slide. Well, these, you mean the, I, okay, so if you mean that slide in the geometric brown in motion example, the meaning is exactly yes. that. If, so this absence of arbitrage condition is equivalent to saying one of the two asset prices must make prices into a martingale by discount. That's an equivalent formulation to this formula that I have written here in the middle of the slide. I hope this answers the question. If not, then please ask again or ask me in the break. Well, I mean, what I'm assuming, of course, is I am giving you, okay, we are given the model. And so, Okay, let me let me say this differently. So this condition here is very specific for this specific Brownian motion example. This is not the general equivalent description for a general two-dimensional semi-martingale situation. This is not the same thing. Can we check this? Well, I'm assuming, of course, that we know the model coefficients. So in that sense, yes, we can check these equations. If you're assuming the model coefficients, coefficients are not known, then you're talking about the market model, which you don't really know. And then we are really are looking at quite different things. Yeah, so, sorry, perhaps what I, uh, I mean, what oh, I, Yes, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going, because I cannot type that fast, the computer is Okay, not. no problem, sure. Yeah, but let me ask, uh, but this is not, uh, in a certain sense, a generic condition. That the, What I meant is, uh, you don't have a generic, uh, it's, it's uh, something that decreases substantially the dimension of the dimensionality of your model. Or, or is there a hope that there is a, a, a kind of uh, stability of that condition? Um, I'm not sure that going in that direction is the good idea. I mean, okay. another equivalent characterization is similar to the existence of an equivalent martingale measure, we have a similar condition like that. And so what you then can do is you can look at your model, you can try to find something like an equivalent martingale measure. Depending on the setup, you may know how to parameterize candidates for martingale measures. And then you can start looking among these, which of course reduces the dimension because then you're just looking for one process. But on the other hand, I mean, it is at the same general level that the existence of a martingale measure, it's always difficult to prove. Right, okay. We should discuss this uh, on the break. Yes, okay, okay. Happy to, yes. All right, so thanks uh, again, Martin. And uh, let me now close this session and the conference will resume uh, in uh, 30 minutes after the break. Okay, thank you very much.